On behalf of the Regional Chambers of Commerce, welcome to the seventh annual Legislative Breakfast. I'm C.G. McCord, Chair of Government Relations for the Kingsport Chamber of Commerce. First of all, I'd like to say thanks to all those who have been involved in putting this event together. Activities such as these give us a stronger presence in government. I'd like to take a minute to recognize the event sponsors. Representing companies are Isaac Webb, Appalachian Power, Jim Pugh, Atmos Energy, Alan Hill, AT&T, Tony Phelan, Charter Communications, Anthony Robinson, Domtar, Etta Clark, Eastman Chemical Company, Brad Knoll, King Pharmaceutical, and Andy Hall, Wellmont Health System. Thanks so much for all you do to support this event as well as our community. Also, thank you to our photography sponsor, Dragonfly Digital. We are also pleased to have with us today Lana Moore, representing Senator Alexander's office, Bridget Baird from Senator Corker's office, Bill Snodgrass and John Abe Teague from Congressman Rowe's office. Thanks. We're here today to focus on issues we'll face this year. It's important for all of us, business and community and elected officials to work together, especially in challenging economic times. To ensure that our business community remains competitive and successful, there are many issues that we look forward to discussing with our elected leaders during the General Assembly. We will now hear a preview of the 2010 Tennessee General Assembly. We'll have time for questions at the end of today's program. To get us started today, please help me welcome our District 2 Representative House Majority Leader, Jason Mumpower. Thank you. It is fantastic to be with you today. It is fantastic to see such a large crowd out today. I know many of you, maybe like me, had to deal with the uh, accident on I-81 and or I-26, wherever it was, kind of in between. I was afraid it would harm our crowd today, but it certainly hasn't and certainly appreciate everyone being here this morning. It is good to be here. It is good to be home from Nashville. I guess all of us up here who are legislators came in last night. Uh, after the third week of our, our session, we spent the first two weeks, uh, as you probably know, in a special session of the legislature. This week uh, was focused on uh, drafting bills and filing legislation uh, for the new year. And really, things start in earnest on Monday night. I am proud to be here with several of my colleagues from the House of Representatives uh, who I enjoy serving with very much along with at least I guess two colleagues from the State Senate who I enjoy serving with okay. Um, <clears throat> just kidding. Um, I do want to, to say hello though before I begin on behalf of uh, our state senator and our state's lieutenant governor Ron Ramsey who desperately wanted to be here today but uh, is in another part of the state. Uh, I know that you all know Ron uh, as, a, as a friend and businessman in our community, and as you know as well, he's running for governor. And uh, regardless of what kind of affiliations you may hold, if you're in this room and you're from Upper East Tennessee, I will tell you that there's nothing more important that you can do for our community than help elect Ron Ramsey as the next governor of Tennessee. And I hope you will join all of us up here in working to do that. And uh, I did want to say a special hello for him this morning. As I mentioned, we are just came out of a special session <clears throat> of the legislature. It started on January the 12th. The first week was focused on the issue of K through 12 education, kindergarten through, through high school. And it was geared around shaping our Tennessee law such that we could qualify for provisions of the federal education program called Race to the Top. The Race to the Top federal education program is one where the federal government is offering uh, certain financial incentives to states which want to strive for the best in education and uh, we had to make some changes to our law in order to even be able to apply for some of that federal funding. We did do that. We revamped uh, how teachers will be evaluated. We revamped how failing schools are treated. You know, we're fortunate here in our, uh, in the hills of Upper East Tennessee 
not to have uh, any failing schools in our region. <clears throat> Excuse me. The but there are parts of the state that do have multiple failing schools. There are at least 13 or 14 failing school districts and schools across the state of Tennessee, mostly in the western part of the state. It is uh, criminal to some degree what has uh, been going on in allowing these schools to continue to fail. We changed the law and gave, our, gave ourselves a little bit more flexibility in what we can do to reach in and pluck out those failing schools and begin to change life for the students that are in those school districts. The second week of the special session focused on higher education and and uh, working with the higher education system there. Hopefully uh, we pass some things that might be able to allow us to better utilize our community college system. We're certainly fortunate here in, in Upper East Tennessee to have a couple of, of shining examples of what community colleges should be like. Uh, Northeast State Community College is, is a prime example. Uh, we hopefully have made it easier for Tennesseans to be able to take advantage of the community college path as well as the four-year institution, the university path. Uh, we've kind of uh, begun to focus more on outcome and, and graduation rates at the uh, university level, which is something that we hope will be very helpful. You know, one thing that occurred to me as we were talking about the education debate, and I think is very appropriate to mention as we're here at the Chamber of Commerce breakfast is that you as employers are really the end user of the education product. And we need to begin to think in that way, and I think we hopefully have begun to think in that way. What we are doing with the education system is preparing young people to, to graduate eventually from college or, or technical school or, or whatever path they choose to take so that they can go out and become productive members of society. And we are producing a product to be used um, you know, as, as employees, <clears throat> and uh, hopefully we have set up a system that will produce a, a better end product and will allow the children of today to be the workforce of tomorrow and, and support their families in the way they would like to, to see. The real work of the special session, or the real work of the session, the real work of this year, the real work of the legislature begins on Monday. Monday, February 1st at 6 o'clock p.m. Central, 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern. Uh, Governor Bredesen will address a joint session of the legislature and he will present his State of the State address, which will include the presentation of his state budget for 2010-2011. Without question, the budget that he presents to the legislature uh, considers issues that are unprecedented in any of our lifetimes. Um, in December, uh, or in kind of the end of December, the first part of January, we recognized in the state of Tennessee uh, an unprecedented mark, the 19th month of negative revenue collection uh, in our state. That's a record by many months. Uh, and I think it's a symptom of it's a symptom of the economy. I don't need to tell you about it. I'm sure you're not surprised about it. It's something that you're experiencing. It's something that families across Tennessee are experiencing. But what we do have is a situation that has created a need uh, for about $1.1 billion worth of baseline budget reductions uh, in the state of Tennessee. Now in the state, we operate every year. We operated last year on about a $28 billion budget. Of that $28 billion budget, $16 billion of it came in federal funds, $12 billion of it was state funds. So what that means is that we're really talking about a $1.1 billion reduction out of a $12 billion pot. That's a significant reduction. Uh, I, I don't need to tell you. Something that's going to happen this year as well is that we're going to kind of experience a double dip cut. We actually cut the budget last year. The economy was in bad shape last year. However, the cuts we made last year were filled in with stimulus money. And so because the stimulus money is not there this year, uh, we will begin to experience the cuts we put in place last year, as well as experience the cuts that we're going to put in place this year. Now down in Nashville, a lot of our colleagues, uh, I don't think anybody at this table, but some of our colleagues are wringing their hands and worrying and fretting about whether or not we can rise uh, 
to, to meet the challenges that, that is ahead of us. And I would tell you, I think, and I think most people, if not all, at this, this table up here with me would tell you that we're not going to look at this as a crisis. We're going to look at this as a challenge. And we're going to look at this as a challenge that we must rise to and that we must meet. And beyond looking at it as a challenge, we're going to have to look at it as an opportunity to make sure the state of Tennessee gets back to doing the things that we need to be doing as a state and perhaps out of the business of doing things that we never should have been doing in the first place because that's just the way it is. The times that we are in force us to do that. I know those of you who operate businesses are doing that every day. And I certainly know those of you who, who are, are operating your family in the same way. You know, as tough as the economy is in the state of Tennessee and as tough it is, as it is across the nation, I will say, fortunately, we are fortunate to be in better shape than most states. I look out there and see some states and the budgets that have been presented so far and, and just see them headed toward a brick wall without any kind of pause in the action. And we are not going to be about that in the state of Tennessee. We are going to be about being fiscally uh, prudent and uh, we're going to get through these tough times. That being said, there's going to be a little little bit of pain to go around for just about everybody. Uh, I would say probably K through 12 education is the one area that will survive almost untouched, but other than that, it's going to be some cutting across the board. As we get ready to go into this year, I am glad to have good friends like we have in the Tennessee Chamber of Commerce. I know, glad to have Deb Woolley uh, with us today, who heads up the Tennessee Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Uh, I don't know if you all have it on your table. We have it on our table, the uh, 10 legislative initiatives of the uh, Tennessee Chamber of Commerce and Industry. That's going to serve as a guide for us in some ways as we're dealing with issues like uh, the state's unemployment trust fund. Many of you know, uh, especially many of you know, if you're employers, I know you know, Last year, the state's unemployment trust fund was on the verge of insolvency as we're still experiencing about 10.9% unemployment in the state of Tennessee. The unemployment trust fund is back in perilous shape. Uh, we did have to make adjustments in the unemployment trust fund rate last year, uh, the rate which employers are charged for unemployment. Hopefully this year we're going to be, we're going to have to shore it up but hopefully this year we're going to do that with a bridge loan from the federal government so that it doesn't dig deeper into the pocket of Tennessee employers uh, as we continue to experience a, a higher than average unemployment rate. That being said, uh, I think we're, we're fortunate at, uh, to be in the positions that we're in and I know that we're all grateful. I know that I'm very grateful and uh, looking forward to getting back to Nashville on Monday and starting the work uh, the real work of this legislative session. I have focused primarily on the budget. There will be any number of other issues on the table this year, whether it uh, has to do with traffic cameras or wine and grocery stores or just about any other issue that you could name it there. We're going to have big issues on the plate this year. So that being said, I, if I haven't mentioned something that you're concerned about, I want to encourage you always to please be in touch with me or my colleagues. I know uh, we're all in the phone book. You can reach us locally or reach us in Nashville. You can call us, you can email us, you can write us, you can stop us in Walmart or whatever you want to do uh, and tell us what you think about issues that are in front of us in 2010. I do want to say as I conclude my remarks, a very special thank you this morning. Events like the one that we are at today do not just happen. Uh, events throughout the year that you uh, participate in, uh, we, those of us who represent Upper East Tennessee, participate in a weekly conference call with the Kingsport Chamber of Commerce Board. And there's one person that really puts it together, and that is Nicole Austin, who serves as the... Director of Government Relations for the Kingsport Chamber. Nicole, as many of you know who know her, is getting ready to become a mother for the first time. And those of us uh, who represent Sullivan County have gone together and we have a gift card, Nicole, for you and Ray uh, as you get ready to uh, become parents for the first time. And we want to say a special thank you to you for all that you do. And I want to say a special thank you to all of you for coming this morning. And I will sit down and let someone else speak. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Leader Mumpower. Uh, now, if you will help me welcome from District 1, Representative John Lumberg. Good morning. So, when I uh, got up here, uh, Senator Crow said, Boy, you can tell who put this together. It's a lot of the House. And aren't we the upper chamber? And, um, Senator Crow, I just want to tell you that there's a lot of things that are being discussed before you get the opportunity to take the podium, so, in, in brevity of remarks. So, Jason, I also noticed that you said you were joined by a couple of colleagues from the House. Uh, Dale, Tony, one of us is, is not a colleague. I'm not even going to wonder about that. Nicole, so congratulations. I almost, almost wonder if it should be Nicole Austin's. Um, a couple of years ago, I did one thing, and I'd like to do the same thing again and talk about this head table. And Miles, Lisa, Gary, would you stand up for just a moment? And I say that because we represent the area politically. You represent the area business community. All of us up here have an incredible relationship with you, and I want to thank you all publicly for what you do. Jason did a phenomenal job of encapsulating things that are going on. Frankly, it's one of those where if you could pick a time to do this update, it would be a week from now after we've seen the governor's proposed budget that we'll see Monday. And I'll tell you, as I was thinking about remarks I should make, it is when Jason referenced the card here, and I think you do have one on the table, I look at the first one that says, get the economy moving. And I'll tell you, there is consensus up here that it's frankly, an easy concept in many ways for us. And I say that because to get the economy moving, we don't create jobs, we create the environment, or at least help to do that. You create jobs, and I'll tell you, the folks up here get that and understand that. I'm very proud. I think uh, uh, every time that I go to Nashville, I'm astounded, frankly, at what we have in Northeast Tennessee. And I say that from the business community to the elected leaders. Uh, Jason touched on some of the school issues we have across the state. And frankly, in Northeast Tennessee, we don't have those kind of issues. But you look at the other side of the state, and there are tremendous issues we have in education. But we have such an intertwined organization, and I say that from the business community, from city government, and higher education, and K-12. It's absolutely phenomenal. I think that's what makes this area success. There are a number of issues. Uh, I think uh, Senator Falk will probably talk about the unemployment compensation fund. It's concerning for all of us, but we do need to maintain stability of that fund rather than risk it being taken over by the federal government, which will cost us all. Um, Jason talked about the budget and also us looking at it as a challenge and I'll, in a positive way. And I think he's absolutely spot on with that. I'll tell you, as a small business person, uh, just like everyone in this room, I think, over the last year, we have looked at ways to trim our budgets. And it's not to make horrific cuts there, or that we were spending, at least in our company, uh, just wildly. But it's things that weren't critical, weren't important to the overall operation of the company. And I know, frankly, from personal experience, I learned some lessons in the past year, and, and our company, I think, has come out stronger from it. And I think you can look for the same thing from state government, uh, and at least that'll be our pledge. And I will, again, keep it short. I will tell you that uh, I feel honored to serve with these folks here. Jason, you do a phenomenal job as our leader, so thank you for all you do. Tony, you are one of the hardest working people up there. I'll tell you this, probably shouldn't, but I get to the office at, uh, I get actually there pretty early, about 7 o'clock. Tony's car is there before my car, so. And I leave relatively late, and Tony, your car is there after I leave. I'm proud of you. So. This car will start. <laughs> so, and, and Dale is just an absolute champion of the folks in his district, and it is an honor to serve. And the relationship we have with the, the upper chamber, I think, is equally very strong. I'm very proud of uh, uh, the folks that are here and honored to serve you. I thank you very much for your time and the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Representative Lundberg. Representative Shipley, he said your car wouldn't start. Is that, is that right? Um, but from District 2, 
Please help me wel welcome Representative Tony Shipley. It's because Mike Falk stole my battery. <laughs> well, good morning, folks. Uh, thank you again for allowing me the opportunity to sit in your seat. It certainly is a pleasure. And <clears throat> as we continue to pat one another on the back up here, I just want to tell you, it's, it's real. Uh, this is really a fine group of fellows to work with. And Jason does make a fine majority leader. And it has just been a pleasure. Uh, we talk constantly. Uh, every day about things. Very seldom do we get to go out to dinner with one another just to visit. Uh, John Gardner was up here a while ago and he was making some comment to me about about uh, going out with Leader Munpower. And sincerely, we don't have time for pleasantries often. Most of the time it is business. When I stop in to the office and stick my head in there, it is to say something that is pertinent to the day. But in any case, it is a lot of hard work. Um, we've been in each other's offices uh, constantly moving issues around. Uh, I was in there yesterday with Senator Crow, and uh, unfortunately I was in Dale Ford's office. I got to listen to <laughs> jokes. <laughs> but uh, in any case, it is a good group. More importantly, and, and something that has uh, really uh, been illuminated to me during this first session, in the beginning of the second one was sincerely the partnership that has been established between the chamber and this delegation and not just the chamber but those of you who are out here individually uh, you may be members of the chamber but your leadership in the community has had a profound effect on how we govern in the state of Tennessee often we say we believe that government works best when closest to those it governs well, Dennis Phillips and Susan Lodahl, where are you at, Susan? Hold your hand up so I can get my eye on you. Where is she? Oh. I have never in all my life met a school board leader who is so gracious with her time as to sit there and text message back to an irritated legislator who is in the middle of discussions about money. And I have never met a mayor who would take my phone call from the floor as quickly as he does and say, Tony, this is what I think. And Mr. Mayor, where are you at? You, sir, had the last say on my vote on education. And that, my friends, is how government works best because there is no such thing as a perfect piece of legislation. And Susan knows on this education issue, I had questions, didn't I, Susan? And I think you did too. And Dennis, you know where I was at and what we were talking about. But it came right down to it, what was the best thing for this community? And this community made a decision on leadership and education, it's been there for a long time. The governor even mentions our higher ed center. They hold us up as a shining example of how it can work and how it does work. As a consequence of that, listening to these leaders who are on the ground, boots on the ground here in the city, they have a tremendous amount of impact on how things work. But leaders such as my good friend Mark Bowery in the insurance industry, and my good friend Sheriff Anderson on immigration issues, Diane and Hank Summers, Highway 126, and my good friends right down there from uh, retired Army people, the Shoops, uh, issues that they bring to me concerning Veterans Affairs. This is a wonderful community. And when you think about all the different things that go on in this state and all the talent that we have sitting here, we just might have an idea how to fix a problem if we continue to talk. And often we do. And Susan and, and Mayor Phillips, I just want to let you know, your talking did make a difference. And I thank you. This year is going to be a very important year. Obviously, uh, the leader spoke to the issues concerning the budget. It is a horrific challenge that's facing us, <clears throat> but I think it's a challenge that we will uh, step up to and solve. I don't think there's going to be a, an easy fix. Um, it's not going to have new taxes in it. Uh, they better not have new taxes in it. Is it going to have new taxes? <laughs> no. No, uh, I, don't, I don't think that's going to happen. That certainly isn't in the best interest of Tennessee during a recession. 
but it's definitely going to be challenging to make the ends come together. Uh, but like Jason and John both said before me, it, we really have a better idea on Monday night after we talk to, uh, talk to the governor and hear what the governor's got to say. Well, with that, uh, let me just say thank you again. It's a pleasure to serve and I look forward to serving for you, with you, and uh, for this community for many years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Shipley. Well, I got a text message and it said, please don't let Representative Dale Ford tell a joke. But uh, from District 6, help me, Representative, help me welcome Representative Dale Ford. Thank you and good morning. By the way, Tony, I'm going to need my jumper cables back. Uh, I had heard a rumor that Nicole was mad at me and now I know it. Look where she sent me. Uh, but it is good to be here. And uh, as Rusty said, money is so tight in Nashville, we've resorted to telling Yogi tales to get money. We'll do anything to bring money back to this area. And you know, he asked me to tell one Yogi tale, and it was e it's easy because it won't take but a second. Back when streaking was very popular, we had a streak in Yankee Stadium one night, and the next night we we're talking about it in the dugout. Somebody said, Yogi, was that a man or a woman? He said, I don't know. They had a hood on them. So that's Yogi's story. But uh, they call me, or they, they tell me I'm the infrastructure representative, and I'm glad to have that title. I appreciate it. And it's been great to work. And the guys that I've worked with, is, uh, like Dennis Phillips, uh, Ryan McReynolds, John Campbell, and Pete Peterson, and Jane Meyer, and those folks, and, uh, and uh, Tom Witherspoon, and even Jonesboro, uh, Kelly Wolf, Bob Branning, and Mike McCracken, those guys have just been phenomenal people to work with. And it's just amazing at what you can get done when you work together. We just uh, turned water on in Gregtown. It's a little community up in Washington County. It's a very depressed area. And uh, somebody told me yesterday, in fact, Ken Ray called me and said it, it opened that water up yesterday or day before yesterday, and that uh, they had been turned down 12 times. Well, this makes me feel really, really good because and Phil Rowe had a great hand in this. Uh, but in my opinion, and Dennis Phillips said the same thing, this day and time, folks, nobody should be without access to utility water. Nobody. And like Jason and these guys said, and one good thing about Jason being our leader, he's easy to spot on the floor. Uh, he's by, you know, he don't have any hair. Uh, it's a very good, very easy, very, he's a good leader. Very, he's always accessible, as are, as are, are we all. But uh, the water, and the education, the, uh, the cameras, we're going to have all kinds, like, like the guys say, we're going to have tons, tons of big issues. And the budget is just going to be, uh, uh, we'll probably have ball bats in the house that day or those days. Uh, it's not going to be easy. It won't be easy. And we knew it wasn't going to be easy when we ran for office. But it is a pleasure to work for you folks. And that's what we do. We represent you and work for you. And anytime we can take suggestions, believe me, we need them, we want them, and we cherish them. Thank you so much. Thank you, Representative Ford. Um, Senator Rusty Crow, um, we welcome you. Thank you for being here with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you for having us this morning. Thanks to all of you for coming. Um, I did uh, walk down to Jason as we came in and say, and say, Jason, I can, sh I really can tell who put this agenda together. <laughs> you know, the, the House members are all first, but it's, Mike, it's kind of nice to to not be at the head of the agenda for a change, isn't it? We get to to listen to what everybody else says. Now, we have no illusions, believe me. Who who leads the way in Nashville? The the rules of the House uh, sometimes can. Uh, can, can make them the upper chamber instead of the Senate. I can tell you, most of you that work with the, with the House know that, uh, especially their, with their committee process. Um, and we generally end up waiting on you guys anyway, don't we, all the time, waiting on them to, to get things over to the Senate. But we're proud. I, Mike and I are really proud of our House members. We have a great delegation. We have a great chamber uh, system here. Uh, you know, Miles and Gary and Lisa and, and, and Candy from Carter County, she's, she's the newest member, I guess, of the of the group. Uh, you guys provide leadership relative to the issues that we deal with uh, in Nashville and it makes it so much easier. 
Um, and Dale Ford, boy. Um, you know, I usually like to go right before Dale Ford and introduce him as, uh, as the legendary Dale Ford. Uh, three championship baseball rings and, and, and two all-star rings as, a, as an umpire. And, and uh, you know, it, it, we joke about it, but things, times are so stressful in Nashville, especially when all of us go to see a commissioner and ask for something that usually requires funding. Uh, and so we take Dale with us to, to, to take some baseballs and tell some jokes and those sorts of things, and it, it lightens things up. We did that actually for Jonesboro this week, uh, trying to, to get a, uh, uh, some infrastructure work done down there and, and a situation that would result in some tax money coming from the, 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 the general fund back to Jonesboro, kind of like Gatlinburg has. And believe me, it took a few, a few jokes to, to get them even thinking about trying to get that fiscal note just right. <laughs> yeah. But we are proud of you. And as Jason said, uh, um, really the, the focus so far has been education, education, education. Uh, we're just now starting into the regular session. And I, I, I want to touch on, on the, the, the two special session efforts very quickly. The the uh, uh, the first part of that special session that dealt with uh, with the K-12, uh, obviously the 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 mandate from the federal government is is leading us in in the direction even even though they call it race to the top and the money is attached to to, to this uh, this situation. Uh, we need to do what we're doing and take those actions that the chamber and 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 TEA and and all the other groups have have talked about, especially looking at what the federal government has us, uh, the direction they have us going, uh, whether or not there's money attached to it or not. We, we need to do what's right, and that's what we tried to do. But the main thing we did that, that I think uh, probably caused some controversy was that we, for the first time, attached achievement scores uh, to evaluations for teachers. But I can tell you that the way we did it was, uh, uh, really, uh, I think, uh, done in, it was done in a way wherein the teacher has a great deal of latitude in choosing what data is utilized. The principal and the teacher can get together and look at their classroom and, and then, you know, not use just the test scores, but use the value-added achievement uh, data and, and a good example is uh, uh, if you have a student, say, that is uh, out for 29 or 30 days of the year, excused absences for some reason, and we have many of those, those students in our school system, that means they've been there for at least 150 days, which means they have to take the, uh, the tests. They have to take all the TCAP tests and those sorts of things which means that their scores are going to count through that teacher's value added uh, performance. Well, the way we did it, the teacher can protest those types of students and work with the principal to throw those out. And there, there, there's lots of leeway for the teachers. And I just wanted you to know that through your leadership and through TA's leadership, working together, the business community and the educational community statewide came up with a pretty darn good way to do this, considering the mandate that we had from the federal government. Um, and, and on the higher education side, you can be proud of this delegation because the three things that we dealt with, first the uh, remedial students um, situation, you know, the, 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 we're going to see the remedial students now really be uh, 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 going in through the two-year colleges, the community colleges, and then up through the, the, uh, the four-year institutions. You're going to see the uh, uh, the curriculum coordinated such that a student that goes to Northeast State or Walter State and tries then to, to, to switch to ETSU doesn't have to worry about having 40 hours and only 20 of those accepted and then have to, to make up all of that which puts them over their four-year graduation cycle and those sorts of things. We, we've done that. And then <clears throat> obviously the formula that was based on numbers of uh, students coming into the system is now going to be based on graduation rates. Now, what's interesting is that when they put all this together, the way the bill was initially uh, did not really uh, give our faculty and our, our academic officers on campuses 
and our universities here that latitude to be a part of the Tennessee Higher Education Commission study that's going to really develop this model. And THEC, under this legislation, is going to decide what the mission of your university is. And so we wanted those people on the ground here in the Tri-Cities, uh, in our area in Upper Northeast Tennessee, to be a part of that study. So this delegation forwarded an amendment to make sure that that happens. No one else did that in the state. And I think you can commend this delegation for doing that. We're proud that, that our people are now going to be involved. And the other uh, uh, element to this legislation that was a little bit scary to me, because you know our universities are a big part of our, our economic engine in this area, and in, in any area, Middle Tennessee, Murfreesboro, Tennessee Tech, uh, Appalachian, uh, uh, not Appalachian, Austin P. But they were going to put all the research funding and effort simply toward that large university, University of Tennessee and the University of Memphis. Uh, and we amended the bill to require that all the faculties in all of our universities have an opportunity to partake in that, that research. And so I think the special session went well for us, uh, much better than it might have. And uh, I think you'll see that it's, it's good for our state. We're going into regular session now. Uh, as Jason said, the budget is going to be very difficult to deal with. We're going to need a whole lot of jokes from Dale uh, to get through this. But what, what, we, what we want to make sure, this delegation has talked about it, and, and I mentioned it as we met in, in health committee this week and began discussing some of the cuts that may take place, especially to our area. We want to make sure that in, in making cuts that we don't destroy infrastructure, and that we don't destroy entire systems. Last year, we were very successful in being able to do that. A good example is the group home uh, system, wherein you have child, uh, children and, and youth, juveniles that are uh, uh, in our institutions because they have raped, they have murdered, they have robbed, they have done things in the community as, as, as young people that, that have gotten them into trouble. Uh, we have a system of group homes wherein when their time is, is served, they don't come back in the community where they can harm people. They come to a group home system where, they're, where they're, they're prepared to get back into the community. Well, last year, that was gone. They were doing away with the entire system. And this, our delegation said, wait a minute, uh, Commissioner Miller, how do you plan to take care of this statewide? Because you've got the one in Memphis that, uh, that houses the mentally challenged kids that are in, in that situation. Uh, you know, it could be some very dangerous situations coming back into homes. We have the girls group home in Elizabeth and the ONA Center in Johnson City. We've got statewide this, this system, uh, and they were doing away with it. And so we, we put in place, uh, we, we said, no, we're not going to allow the system to be deterred like that. What would the next governor do? And so uh, we managed to save that. And we managed to, to, to bring back a great deal of the, the mental health money and a great deal of the uh, community funding that's for people that simply cannot take care of themselves in their own homes. As Jason said, that's going to be very difficult this year. But we want to make sure that the cuts we make don't hurt people and, and don't destroy systems and, and infrastructure. And so we'll be working very hard with you as a chamber. Please work with us. Uh, I know you, you're very good at at that most of you uh, we see in Nashville on a, on a weekly basis and uh, continue to do that. We're with you and we're proud of you. We love you guys uh, and uh, God bless all of you. We'll all be in there working together. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Crow. Now from Senate District 4, Senator Mike Falk, welcome. Thank you, Senator. <clears throat> How many of you remember Gomer Pyle, USMC? Y'all remember Gomer? Oh, Gomer used to say, thank you, thank you, thank you. You remember that? Well, it's my job here this morning to say three thank yous. First of all, thank you for my job. While it's the highest honor of my lifetime to serve in the state senate, I want you to know that every day I wake up, I learn something new about what a special privilege it is to serve the folks in the 4th Senate District. Secondly, thank you for sending Ron Ramsey to Nashville. I don't think anybody 
if you sit down and think about it for just a second, understand the significance and the importance of Ron Ramsey being the Lieutenant Governor of the state of Tennessee. All of you have heard all of your lives, Tennessee stops in Knoxville, haven't you? Folks, they know now that there's Tennessee beyond Knoxville. Here's why. The Speaker Pro Tem of the Senate is from Knoxville. The Chairman of the Senate Environment Committee is from Morristown. The chairman of the Health and Welfare Committee is from Johnson City. The chairman of the Calendar Committee is from Hawkins County. And the lieutenant governor is from Sullivan County. It's no wonder that the successes in this state in education, in business, in industry are showing up in Northeast Tennessee and it's because of Ron Ramsey's leadership. And frankly, we're gonna make a mistake if we don't elect him the next governor of the state of Tennessee. Secondly, or thirdly rather, thank you for what you do. You may not recognize the accolades that Northeast Tennessee and Kingsport in particular uh, has been receiving over the last few years. You remember the award from Harvard. The governor in his very address regarding the special session concerning education cites as a shining example of what can be done in education, Kingsport's Higher Education Center. Rusty talked about race to the top and our use of Tennessee Higher Education Commission in crafting a new model for education in Tennessee. What he didn't mention is graduation rates from community colleges across the state average 12%. You know who the best two in the state are for graduation? Walter State and Northeast State. Good things are happening here because of you, the leadership that you have with the local chamber. Uh, Miles was invited to be in Nashville for the governor's address regarding education, and I was so very proud to see you there. I understand why that is. Let me take uh, two more minutes to talk about two very mundane subjects, but I do think they're important to you. And one John Lundberg mentioned, that is the state's unemployment fund. We have had 18 consecutive months of decline in revenues for the state government. We, we projected what the revenues would be. After last year's budget, we obviously projected that they would be even smaller. Revenues have not met those projections. There's an inverse relationship between state revenues and the increase in expenditures in the unemployment fund. I think that's obvious. So we are draining to the point of danger, the state's unemployment fund for those folks who are unemployed. What does that mean? Something has to be done to bolster the unemployment fund. And basically we have two choices. One choice is to raise the base upon which unemployment compensation is paid. Last year we raised the base up to $9,000. It used to be seven. So an employer pays unemployment compensation up to last year on the first $7,000 of an employee's earnings. After last year, it's the first $9,000 of the employee's earnings. And this year, I suspect that there will be in the governor's budget a suggestion that that be raised even more to keep that fund solvent. Keeping that fund solvent is the right thing to do in these tough times. But the question is, how do you keep it solvent? Another alternative would be for the state to borrow from the federal government unemployment compensation money. But if we do that, we can pay it back within a year. Where's the money going to come from to do that? And I suggest that there is no source to pay that back. Or if you take the federal money, you have to up the unemployment benefits and that binds us into the future. So we all seek your input on how to best resolve the unemployment compensation issue. It's something that's going to hit most of you in the back pocket. Uh, all of us are willing to listen. The Wednesday uh, conference call is an important opportunity if you want to participate in that, but it's a matter that must be dealt with during this session. The final matter that I'd like to speak to you about just for a second is the state's rainy day fund. And I think this is best explained as I heard the Lieutenant Governor explain it to a group last week. 
just like a family budget. We all have our family budget. We spend so much money on rent or paying the house note each month. We spend so much money for gasoline, for car insurance. We spend money on cable TV. Some of us have 120 channels. Some of us have 65 channels. We have a little money in the bank as a savings account. And in hard times, when you liken the state's budget to the family budget, you get cut back from 40 hours a week to maybe 35 hours a week. You don't have the income coming in that you did, so you have to cut something back. What do you do? Well, you cut back from 120 channels to 65 channels. Instead of, if Pal Barger's here, going by Pal's and having burgers twice a week, you may cut back to once a week. You do the little things to ratchet your budget back to try to deal with less revenue. The question is this. Have we gotten to the point where we're willing to raid the savings account to keep our lifestyle up, to keep the 120 cable channels and so forth? Or are we going to cut out all the frills to try to get down to where we don't raid the savings account? Now, there's going to be a big push to raid the savings account, the state's rainy day fund. My position is really pretty simple, and it's kind of feel your way through. If the economy continues to decline, and we've been told for months now, it's turning around, it's turning around. Well, folks, unemployment continues to go up, and I'm not sure it's turning around. But if you see a turnaround over the next three or four months, and it's a consistent trend upward, maybe we're justified in spending a little bit of that savings to protect the social safety net. But if the economy continues to decline, we'd better look at what's going to hit us in the next year or two. So it's going to be a very big issue, and it may be the area for the biggest fight in this General Assembly is what we do with that rainy day fund. Will we use it to balance the budget for one year? Will we protect it in fear of an economy that worsens? I suggest to you that you need to stay tuned on that particular issue. Once again, thank you for the opportunity to serve you. Thank you for all of you who have worked so hard to make this a successful event this morning. Please feel free to call us if you have suggestions, if you have questions. Have a great morning. Thank you, Senator Falk. And while we're not able to be in Nashville um, all the time, we do have a presence down there through the Tennessee Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And we're delighted today to have with us Deb Woolley, the President and CEO of the Tennessee Chamber. Welcome, Deb. Thanks, CG. And thanks to everybody for having me here. I guess they saved best for last. I mean, I don't know what else to say. Absolutely. I was behind the house. I was behind the deliberative body. I've had the legendary Dale Ford. I've had Gomer Pyle. <laughs> I don't know what to do. In most places where I go, I like being last, particularly behind legislative delegations because you get to set the record straight when they get through. <laughs> here, here all I can do is look both ways and say, guys, thank you. <coughs> I mean, you do a fantastic job. You represent not only the people of the Northeast Tennessee well, you represent all of us very well. Um, they're a joy to work with, they care, they understand that you're the business community, that you provide the jobs. And you guys are just really lucky to have them, each one of you. So thank you. Um, just going to take a few minutes to touch on a couple things. The special session was phenomenal. I think what they accomplished in that special session, which proves that, hey, they can do major legislation in less than two weeks without shooting anybody um, and get out of there and didn't spend a lot of money either. It was, it was a good thing. I hope it carries over into the challenges we have in the regular session. Um, because it was, pretty, it was pretty major. And I think as we go on down the road, a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, what was done in these last 10 or 11 days is gonna change the face of education across the state of Tennessee. And we will all benefit from that. Um, Jason, thanks for mentioning the 10 for 10. You all have this. I'm not gonna read it to you. I would suggest that since I'm the only thing standing between you and a snowstorm, you take it home this weekend when you got your feet up in front of the fireplace, you have that nice drink of choice, be it milk or whatever. You can read this, you can ponder it, and then you can call and ask any questions. I'll touch on a couple things. Um, 
we have some issues this year that we'd like to see done. It's not a year to do anything that costs, but there are a few things that need to be fixed, a few things that can be done that, that create better policy. Some in the workers' comp area, you all were instrumental four years ago when we redid the workers' comp system. The people at the table were instrumental in making it happen. Our goal since then has been to protect it. There are three bills we're putting in this year that protect the intent of those reforms, and we hope that we'll have support from the delegation up here and you're all support in doing that. There's a third issue that's out there that was actually just filed last week as a regulatory change by the department that would require all workers' comp meetings when you're working with an employee um, and, the, and the Benefit Review Council to conference to be face-to-face. -face. Now you can do them by phone, you can do them by mail. Employers are telling us that if every meeting has to be in person, you're looking at adding anywhere from 5 to 20% to the cost. Uh, we don't understand why, so we'll be working on that. Unemployment insurance is a key issue to us. I will tell you we had an unemployment insurance advisory committee meeting last week. What our committee recommended to the department, and we'll be sitting back like you all will be next Monday to see what's in the governor's budget, is that we use the federal loan not as a loan but as a line of credit. And there is apparently, from what they're telling us, and we're still looking into this to make sure it doesn't carry the things that, um, that Mike mentioned because they scare us to death, those, those requirements into the future, is that if you pull down from the federal loan and you pay it back within a very short period of time, like within eight weeks, then it carries no obligations. What we see from the, the Tennessee studies of the Unemployment Insurance Act right now of our cash flow is in the first quarter of next year, the fund will go into the red. By, by March 30th, we'll be in the red. By April 30th, when all the first quarter contributions, payments come in, we'll be back in the black. We collect a lot of money in the first quarter, but it's not due to April 30th. You know, I sit here with 12 employees, and I can tell you right now, I don't send them my money till April 28th. So if we can use it as a bridge loan from sometime in April, but pay it back out of the fund, not from employer assessments, before the end of April or before the end of June, then it's not supposed to bring obligations. I think that's something we've asked them to look at. We've asked them to use that as a management tool, not as a loan. Uh, I'd ask you all if that comes up to, to help us look at it deeply because we don't need any federal control of our system and we certainly don't need them mandating any of our coverages that go on out. Beyond that, we're gonna be trying to play some protection. Um, I will tell you, there's always some creative people who in this year seed revenue and they say, I'm not gonna raise any taxes, but I got a revenue enhancer. I'm gonna change the rules, but not raise the taxes. It's, it's hard. Um, these guys help protect against that. We'll ask you to help us protect against that as some of the proposals come up. And other than that, all I can tell you is it's going to be a short year, I hope. Is this, come on. <laughs> it's going to be a warm year after this weekend, I hope. And you all have a good weekend. Thanks for having me here. Go get your bread, milk. <laughs> what else do we get? <laughs> and have a good weekend. <laughs>